Imagine, a musical colleague who can master any style yet performs in a distinctive voice. When you share your composition, you're immediately rewarded with a memorable performance. Don't go looking on Craigslist for this ideal bandmate and collaborator. It's Holly Plus, an AI musician created with machine learning. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're talking with composer, musician, and sound artist Holly Herndon, whose most recent full-length album, Proto, was released in 2019. We're also talking with Matt Dryhurst, a musician, researcher, and artist who also teaches at NYU's Clive Davis Institute of Music, Strelka Institute, and the European Graduate School, and hosts discussions with figures shaping 21st century culture on the Interdependence Podcast. Thank you both so much for joining us today. So Holly Plus was born this month. She emerged this month. But it sounds like she's been a long time in the making. Can you tell us a little bit about who she is and how she came to be? Holly Plus is what I like to call my digital vocal twin. And it's essentially a kind of a web-based instrument that consists of a machine learning model that anyone can upload any MP3 to the website and it will return that music sung in my unique voice. So that's what we're really excited about because it's kind of a new thing to be able to transfer polyphonic audio into a voice model. For the sake of our listeners, can you just draw like a kind of better picture of what Holly Plus is? I like to use the term machine learning rather than AI because I feel like it's a bit more descriptive. So Holly Plus is essentially a machine learning model of my unique voice that can perform any music that it's given in my voice. So the machine kind of studies my voice through kind of isolated tracks of my voice, tries to figure out the logic of my voice, and then it performs in that kind of learned logic. And this is all done through a web interface. So it's super easy for anyone to use. And is there also a visual component to this or is it just the audio? Well, at the moment, it's just the audio. Our website is very cool looking. <laughs> <laughs> We're using WebGL to do kind of a cool website. Yeah, it's a beautiful website. But it's not like there's a virtual model of you as a person also doing this, like these sort of holographic concerts that some people are doing. It's not like that. It's just the audio. So people can upload all kinds of music or vocal tracks. Am I understanding that correctly? You can upload whatever you want, as long as it's in a, the format of an MP3. In fact, someone recently uploaded the sound of their local train, and it was stunningly beautiful because then Holly Plus kind of sings back these really interesting kind of harmonics that the train was making. This seems like an opportune time to play just a little bit of a sample of what Holly Plus sounds like. So here we go. So you were also talking about being able to do polyphonic. For the layperson, what does that mean? So polyphony is essentially more than one line. So whenever you have more than one line in music overlapping, then you have something that's polyphonic. So what the computer has to do to understand what to perform back, it has to kind of separate those sound sources and understand all the different lines that are happening so that it can then perform it in my voice. And that's a very complicated process, but we finally have reached that point. So most people will be familiar with the harmony. When you listen to a harmony, you're listening to polyphony because there's more than one thing happening. And it just so happens that the group of people we work with that never before heard sounds figured out how to do that, which as people who've been involved in this space now for five or six years was a big breakthrough. Yeah, previous, kudos to them. Yeah, previously a lot of the machine learning, they call it timbre transfer. A lot of these techniques were monophonic. So you could run one line through like one single string violin line through it and it would transfer it. But with Holly Plus, you're able to deal with polyphony, which is really cool because then that allows for what Holly just said. You can literally upload any think and it doesn't get as confused as it might have done if you're training a machine to only find one melodic line and it can't deal with anything else that's a very limited tool 
the tool Holly Plus really opens it up, I think, for people in that way, because the, the most disappointing thing possible is you tell people, hey, you can make music with this crazy machine learning likeness of Holly or whoever. And then they upload something and what they get back sends like trash because right. the system doesn't know how to deal with most things. So that's a bit of a breakthrough on the nerdy side. This is really cool. If I had some kind of choral piece with a bunch of voices and I uploaded it, then Holly Plus would be able to sing all the parts? Exactly. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> or if you uploaded a string quartet, Holly Plus would sing all of the different instruments. And in fact, if you upload like a pop song, Holly Plus will sing the percussion line, it'll mm -hmm. sing the bass line. And of course, some things work better than others. So that's why when Holly brings up the train example, that was like a gorgeous example because a train doesn't really have a melody in the classic way, but there is a lot going on there. There is a polyphonic harmonic mm -hmm. richness to it. And that just happened to work really, really well. There's other things I've heard that end up garbling and sounding kind of strange, but that's what's kind of fun is that you can kind of throw things in there and uh, you don't know what you're going to get. How long did it take you to get to this point where you had the Holly Plus model able to do these kinds of things from user submitted uploads? Well, Holly Plus has been in the works this year, but you know, there was a lot of work that led up to be able to conceive of Holly Plus. And so our work with machine learning, I would say started in 2016, is that right? 2015, 2016. 2015, 2016. We actually released a track called Godmother on our last album called Proto on 4AD. And that's also using a model of my voice, but it's an earlier model. And you can already hear within that time frame how much the model has improved. Did you all write the code for this or do you work with coders? Holly, you're the musician and singer, right? You know, I never really think of myself as a singer, but I probably uh, should start to. <laughs> should start to. <laughs> I think of myself as a kind of like general artist. I don't know. It's like an easier thing for me to deal with. <laughs> it's a good question, though, because when you're dealing with these techniques, and this has been the case from the beginning, oftentimes a lot of the code is being sourced from different research organizations or companies in some cases that are releasing this code out to the public. And that's one of the reasons why there's been kind of an explosion of interest with both artists and developers in this space is first off, a lot of GPUs, so graphical processing units that people use for gaming became widely available and all of a sudden they became very powerful. So you could run these things locally at home. And on top of that, a lot of companies were releasing their code to allow people to experiment. And so in actuality, I would say that for a Holly Plus, there's no doubt a bunch of open source code in there there's some definite secret source from Yotam Man and Christina who figured out polyphony. <laughs> but in terms of actually putting it all together, what's kind of interesting about these technologies, at least at this point in time, is that everything is kind of being sourced from a wide group of researchers. And it's really just about thinking of the right project that you want to put together to give purpose to this code that's just kind of flying out there. You may not be able to answer this, but what was the impetus for wanting to do a project like this where you could have people submit their audio recordings or their little snippets and have your virtual Holly Plus voice engine perform it? And I'm just curious about what that inspiration or flash looked like. Well, it kind of started back in 2015, 2016, as Matt mentioned, some of these um, research papers were being released and we had some friends who were tinkering and we also began tinkering. And also around that same time, I started working with a vocal ensemble in Berlin. And then eventually those two things kind of came together and I started training models on our vocal ensemble and we created what we like to call our AI baby, Spawn, who became another kind of member of our vocal ensemble. And so Spawn would perform alongside the human human vocalist and we created this kind of you know strange hybrid choir and we enjoyed performing with Spawn and with the ensemble so much and we had so many questions from our audience who were curious about the process that we really wanted to kind of lower the barrier to entry a little bit by creating this web tool that anyone could use and play around with and get a feel for what it's like to use a machine learning model. We discussed this a little bit with Chris and Yotam, who, who helped us out specifically on Holly Plus. There's so much said specifically when you raise the term AI that we find ourselves in an odd position where we are very, very excited about what it is. And sometimes we often find ourselves in the odd position defending what others claim it to be. And so putting a tool out and saying, look, this is really cool. You couldn't do this before kind of quiets that down and makes it really clear what we're excited about, if that makes some sense. When terms like AI come up, people start talking 
thinking about like automated composition systems and humans becoming irrelevant and all that rubbish. And for us, it's like, no, you can train a machine learning model to sing. That's unbelievable. So putting the tool in people's hands, I think demystifies it a little bit, but doesn't take away any of the novelty of it. Because there is a real danger, and this is maybe a broader conversation, I think with this stuff that it always in most people's minds stays in the future. You know, it's always this kind of archetypical folkloric thing that stays in the future. And so in actuality, it's far more interesting for us to give it to people and let people come to their own conclusions based on playing with it. We've thought a lot about what it means to train a model on myself and on other people. There's all kinds of rights and IP considerations around that. And so the only kind of solution that we found that we felt good about was to train a model on myself personally and then to release that to the public. When you say train the model, what does that actually mean? So any machine learning AI system has a training set or a training canon, as some people call it. And that's essentially whatever data the person who's training decides they want their canon to be that will directly influence the outcome of, of what the model then can produce. So in my case, it just meant that I needed to record hours of my uh, solo voice no accompaniment in order for the computer to essentially learn the probabilities of my voice and kind of the architecture of vocal decisions. That's actually one of the reasons initially we used the child metaphor, because in many cases it is somewhat analogous. This machine has no other context. It only knows what you place in front of it. And the training model, if you choose it to be Holly's voice, that's what it will understand and that's what it will know how to perform. Right. So anything that you give it, it tries to perform in Holly voice because exactly. that's the only world that it knows. But we've done a lot of experiments, for example, like when we were touring the last record, we would hold training ceremonies with the audience. So in some cases with thousands of people, we would invite them to sing lines along with us so that we could model that collective voice. Um, and that would have to be a separate model. But basically, if the model is only exposed to a lot of people singing something, that's what it will understand and that's what it will be able to reproduce as an output. I'm just curious, what does a voice model look like? I mean, is it a bunch of code? Is it something you can see? Is there a graphical thing? Do you have to be able to interpret lines of Python or something? <laughs> It's a bunch of lines of code. I wish that it was some kind of beautiful. <laughs> it is quite beautiful in a sense, right? That when you're talking about models, it's worthwhile you raising Python because it is actually largely conducted in Python. But what we're talking about here, which takes the metaphor a bit further, is you're talking about training a neural network, right? We talk about models because models are understood. Where the neural network metaphor is imperfect, but it's kind of helpful, is that you think about different connections being made between things, like in a neural system or like in a brain. And that's kind of what the model is. It's kind of a bunch of different idiosyncratic connections or conclusions or analogies made between what it's been exposed to in the training set and the training canon. Um, you've seen a lot of this with like image generation, which is probably a way better analogy for people to get. If you showed a neural network only Van Gogh paintings, what the neural network will attempt to do is create analogies or create an understanding of the different connections that make those Van Gogh paintings Van Gogh paintings. In fact, the neural network doesn't even know it's Van Gogh painting, right? Because it has no context. But it will look at the training canon and try and find the special connections between things. And at which point you would then be able to infinitely produce paintings in that idiom of Van Gogh. And it's very similar with the voice. We're just dealing with audio files, but you can do it with a lot of different stuff. The voice model looks at things like how you move from note to note or how you phrase your music and then adapts whatever new information it's given to that style. I'm not sure what the word would be, but however you sing naturally is how it understands all music to be. Exactly. There are several different approaches to using machine learning in music, and a lot of more historical examples have used scores and MIDI analysis. So MIDI, for the listeners who might not be familiar with that, that's kind of a way for a machine to understand pitch and amplitude, so volume. So you could train a machine learning system to understand your compositional style and then ask that machine to compose in your style new works. And that was kind of what was the popular way to work for decades. And then more recently, we were given this uh, capability to do style transfer, which is what we're talking about with these models. So we're dealing specifically with audio material rather than abstracted audio through scores or MIDI files. Some of our earliest experiments, because style transfer was first kind of coming around in the visual realm. So so what we were doing is we were taking our audio and turning that into spectrograms, which is a kind of visual representation of audio, and then doing a style transfer there and then turning it back into audio. And it sounded terrible, <laughs> but, it was, <laughs> but it was kind of a proof of concept. 
because that was before we had the ability to work with audio how desperate we were to apply these techniques in the audio realm we were trying to do anything and actually i really cherished that early stuff though because even though it does sound bad (laughs) it sounds like the beginnings of something Mm -hmm. that and you can trace a line to where we are now and where we likely will be in five years time by listening back to that so it's very romantic i think (laughs) absolutely you're listening to augmented humanity we'll be back in just a minute Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for talking with us today. I wanted to talk a little bit about how the rest of the world can come and interact with Holly Plus. One of my weird obsessions is reading want ads and trying to understand people from the things they're looking for. And there's always people looking for bandmates, right? There's always, I need a bass player, I need a lead singer. So I understand how Holly Plus would be so appealing to musicians, but practically, let's say I was doing open mic and I can play guitar, but I can't sing. Can I get Holly Plus with me on the open mic and have those MP3s? Are there restrictions on people using Holly Plus or performing with Holly Plus, recording with Holly Plus? At the moment, Holly Plus is entirely free and open to use. So you can have a concert with Holly Plus. You can make a record with Holly Plus. You can pretty much do anything you want with Holly Plus and it's yours and you're free to do that. At the moment, you wouldn't be able to sing live through Holly Plus. She would have to be kind of pre-recorded on your backing track. But we're working on making a real-time time system possible. At the moment, really, maybe the best analogy for where Holly Plus is at. Holly Plus is kind of like an instrument at this point in time. There are a few things we're working on very soon that will allow for vocal articulations that might make it more analogous to a singing voice. That's kind of in the plan. And ultimately, we feel like that's kind of an inevitability. But for right now, anyone can experiment with it. And we're kind of seeing this phase as a little bit of like a test phase of just seeing like what the demand is. It's really curious how people are using it. And also um, how we feel about it. Yeah. Well, more, <laughs> most importantly, how you feel about it. Cause <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the really interesting <clears throat> thing about this version of Holly Plus, because language is not a part of it. And you can still very much hear the kind of neural network quality in the instrument itself. It's a little bit easier to kind of open that up and make that freely available to anyone. I think it becomes a more difficult decision once Holly Plus starts to actually sound one-to-one like my speaking voice and singing voice. So that's kind of a bridge that we'll have to cross in the future, but we're kind of thinking about those questions right now. How do you work toward that point? I mean, is this more machine learning? I mean, are you just continuing to teach this model? Well, ultimately, there'll be separate models. So when we discuss the code stuff, the public presentation of this will be under one banner. But in actuality, different models are good at different things and different transformers and so on. It's a very different approach to, for example, invite Holly Plus to sing a line in a pitch that you determine, that sing words that you wrote, is very, very different to the style transfer process that we're using currently, which will basically take like a guitar line and turn it into Holly's voice. Fundamentally, in the not too uh, distant future, future, all of these things will fall under the same banner, but those are actually very, very different challenges. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, and again, this is more for the benefit of the listener who may not have had an opportunity to go and listen to all this stuff. What your model now, in a sense, is more abstract. When it's singing, it's more like (laughs) doo-wop than it is singing actual lyrics. That's something that it sounds like you're trying to think about ahead of time, because it's one thing for people to upload their audio files and have a more abstracted vocal representation come back to them from your model. But it's different if someone uploads a bunch of homophobic, racist, neo-Nazi lyrics that would then come back sung in your voice with lyrics. 
Exactly. I mean, this is a huge consideration. And of course, we've thought about, okay, you know, you can have certain words that the model just refuses to sing. You can kind of pre-program that. But people are very creative and they often find workarounds <laughs> with combinations of different words. So I, I feel like ultimately that it's kind of an unstoppable thing. So one thing that we're thinking about is the ability to certify or authenticate specific pieces of media that we approve. So we've been working on this idea of a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization. So for listeners who are not familiar with that, it's kind of like an online co-op that you can organize. And so with this community of people, we hope to be able to steward the official usage of the voice. So while we still want to leave the option open to the wider public to be able to kind of do whatever they want with the voice, we want to have a kind of certain channel of official use cases so people will know the difference between these, you know, potentially hazardous uses and then the approved uses. So in a sense, that would be like community moderation of the voice. That's pretty gutsy. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's gutsy, but I feel like the sad thing, but just the reality of this is that this is coming fast. So in a way, our whole premise for the past few years has been to just take as our base assumption that in a few years time, from the voice that you guys have been sharing with us right now, I could create a model from you and I could speak in your likeness tonight. We've, we've known that, that is not a threat, by no, the way. No, no, yeah, exactly. I'm, Careful I'm, what leaving you say, this session. I'm, I'm leaving this session. <laughs> no, but the, no, but the point is, is that, you know, we've been operating from the assumption that this is just going to happen because we know that we can do it ourselves and it's only a matter of time before everybody has the ability to do it. And so as gut-wrenching or as kind of scary as that scenario is, we feel our best approach is to jump out in front of it and at least try and kind of wrestle some control on the situation understanding that nobody right now has come up with a pretty good or convincing uh, solution for verifying a real person versus their likeness. So while the situation, you can think of a million scenarios that it would be really bad, I think they're probably, probably going to happen anyway. The, the, the actual real challenge is figuring out a way in which it could be good and being able to determine if someone says something crazy online, you can trace back and see whether Holly approved that or not. And if she didn't, then it's on them. It's like someone taking your image and doing something crazy in Photoshop. You can't control that. That's the sort of negative side, but obviously you're doing this because you think it's awesome and cool. So what would be the positive side of that? It's one thing if someone wants a backup singer or to have an accompaniment, say, in a performance, but what is it that a person would do that would be so awesome about this besides just the sort of experimental value of it? I don't know if that's a good question. Great I think question. that's a great question. I mean, we've been kind of fantasizing about, you know, what if we were collaborating with thousands of people around the world through this Holly Plus model? And what if we were in a band with hundreds of people or thousands of people? And what if they were having their own concerts? And what if someone wrote something so compelling with Holly Plus that we wanted to perform that in our own concerts? And then that became a kind of back and forth with the fans or with collaborators. So in a way, it kind of opens up the practice in a way that we haven't been able to do in the past. And that's part of the idea behind the co-op is ultimately, you know, when you think about the most chaotic components of where this could go, that's quite easy to think about, right? But one of the great benefits of this kind of online co-op model is also just the coordination possibilities, right? If you had hundreds of people contributing to a catalog of works that are created with Holly Plus that have been approved, you can imagine seeing a scenario where someone could be performing those works in Rio de Janeiro tonight and someone could be performing in London at the same time, right? There's all these kind of different different possibilities that come from you all having a shared kind of investment and interest in that character. And what's kind of interesting about this, obviously, is that Holly Plus fundamentally is a character, right? Like Holly <laughs> Plus is a kind of fictional twin that happens to be modeled after a real person. Um, <laughs> but there's so much more you can do with that character, particularly when more people are invested in that character and more people are experimenting with it than we could possibly do with Holly, who disappointingly is just one person in space. <laughs> <laughs> and this is kind of a parallel conversation is that that kind of common or collective stewardship of a character or of a band we personally see that as happening it's another inevitability and so thinking about ways to deal with stickiness of ip thinking about also just the drama that could transpire between like holly and holly plus <laughs> <laughs> and also just the ability to explore entirely new identities by being able to perform characters in a specific way i exactly. think is really empowering and exciting what do you mean by stickiness of ip it's tricky in the case of the Holly Plus project. I mean, Holly, actually, her doctoral thesis was based on IP considerations with vocal likenesses. So this has been worked out for a long time. But it's a sticky area for intellectual property because we haven't really had an analogous technological development before. One analogy some people use is sampling, which is a very imperfect analogy because 
we've been using the term spawning rather than sampling. Sampling is kind of like you're able to mechanically reproduce something and maybe you can change the pitch in it a little bit, but it's basically what it was. Spawning is being able to say, no, I can analyze who you are and I can spawn new artworks from you. We don't really have a legal framework or a moral ethical framework for what that is. I mean, we're still catching up with sampling and piracy, right? We don't know what that means. And so fortunately with working with Holly, who's really interested in this, we get to experiment because fundamentally decisions that we make or that Holly makes, we're responsible for, right? It's our IP, it's Holly's IP, it's Holly's likeness. But this is going to turn into a total minefield where you can already go online, for example, and create songs with Kanye West's voice um, using a very different technique. But we're in kind of uncharted territory. It'll be very interesting to see where people take this. Our approach in a sense is saying look on the bright side of things like find the silver lining more people wanting to experiment with a public figure's voice is good we just need to figure out the mechanisms to make that work out for everybody but at the same time there's going to be a lot of people who are really upset about it and there's going to be lawsuits I think that social model is a really valuable part of what is awesome about this project. You know, when we've been talking to people about some of the tech trends like machine learning or being able to create deep fakes or whatever, everybody acknowledges that we need really sensible regulation. We need to think about how to avoid the bad, chaotic, possible dystopian futures with all of this, but that our governmental systems are currently probably not capable of growing grappling with all the issues around this and passing legislation. And so creating a model like this where you have a community invested in responsible use and where other artists can say, here's how I want to be spawned or duplicated or or represented. If people are going to do this, here's the ways that you can approach it. I guess the other part of it is that there's sort of an international whack-a-mole where something might be legal in one country, but not legal in another country. And so setting up something that can be used transnationally, responsibly, and with full consent of the artist, that's really huge. I mean, that's sort of leapfrogging over all the governments of the world to create this. And I think that's incredibly valuable. Thank you. Are there other artists who are interested in adopting your IP DAO management model? Well, there are certainly artists who are interested in using Holly Plus, and they have been using Holly Plus creatively. In terms of our DAO structure, that's something that we're honestly still working out and figuring out. You know, you spoke to the fact that governments are kind of slow sometimes to respond to the needs of current technologies. And that's one thing that, you know, we're kind of like ramming up against now, trying to figure out the correct legal structure for the DAO. And I think I figured it out, but I'm having to read, you know, (laughs) really difficult legal document. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing. So I hope that once we fully figure it all out, that we can then make those learnings public so that other people can hopefully follow in our footsteps. And also there's a huge community of DAO lovers, largely on Twitter, who I'm able to reach out to and ask people, you know, what's your experience with this? How did you set this up? And so it's kind of a thing that's happening now. It's kind of in process. People are learning by doing. You know, Matt and I have been thinking about these questions academically for several years, and it's not really until you kind of start trying to put those answers into practice that you learn all of the intricacies of the issues that come up. So that's why we wanted to just jump in and and give it a go. Yeah, exactly. It's also what's kind of funny is that in a way, there's some nice symmetry between how new a lot of this machine learning AI stuff is and how new a lot of these kind of decentralized governance technologies are. That weirdly, what's nice working between those two worlds is in a sense, you can kind of forget that the rest of the world exists. Of course, it, <laughs> of course it does. And if we were dealing with somebody else's intellectual property or someone else's likeness, it would be a whole other consideration. But because it's kind of in family, in a strange way, we can kind of pilot this as a different economic system elsewhere. And so, for example, a lot of these disputes around like IP came up a lot around the uh, NFT moment that was happening in the last year. Um, and that's an, another great case in point, right, where like people coming from a traditional system of intellectual property you're looking at it and being like well you could just screenshot it what does this matter (laughs) and then people in the nft world are saying no we're creating you know this immutable ledger of interactions and agreements between people and the government will catch up we're definitely in that camp of trying to come up with a great system unfortunately we can do that because we own the ip you know we're not taking liberties with anybody else but those days are coming oh yeah they're Mm -hmm. coming (laughs) they're here (laughs) you're listening to augmented humanity We'll be back in just a minute.
Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you all so much for explaining how Holly Plus came to be and how she works. I wanted to talk a little bit about other people's perceptions of what you're doing and how people might feel about Holly Plus. You said earlier that you use machine learning rather than AI because people are like, AI, you're going to replace all the artists with robots. But you also seem comfortable with addressing the issue of deep fakes, which I think is a much more pejorative term, right? How have people been reacting to your work? Does Holly Plus scare people or inspire them? I would say it's a mixed bag. The majority of people are pretty excited about it. I mean, ultimately, it's a free tool that anyone can play with and have fun with. So it's kind of difficult to get mad at that. I think some people have misunderstood what's exciting or novel about it and maybe think that it's like a sampler or are unimpressed because they're maybe not understanding what's unique about it. And that's okay. That's something that will come with time. It ends up being kind of a Rorschach test where everyone feels like they have some familiarity with it. And so oftentimes, one of the benefits of releasing this tool and releasing kind of a lot of literature around it and kind of opinions around it coming from us personally is that we can be really clear with what it is and what it isn't. Because oftentimes we'll find ourselves having conversations with people and the word AI comes up and we're talking about two completely separate things. There's this kind of nice balance where hopefully through the tool and other things we're doing, we're showing people a path to do stuff that they maybe haven't been able to do before. In fact, I'm pretty sure they haven't been able to do before. But at the same time, we're not overselling it. And that's kind of a position of responsibility that I feel like we have to adopt. But it's also important to get past negative archetypes and, and honestly, very old stories. A lot of the lore around AI or whatever, this is a very, very old story. It goes back hundreds of years, actually. The idea of automata and humans placed in the universe or whatever. That stuff's all fascinating. You can also go on YouTube and find a bunch of uh, quote unquote intellectuals talking about sentient machines constantly. It's like, it's this thing that people get excited about. And I can relate to that somewhat. What we're talking about is using new and very, very exciting techniques to do new stuff that doesn't have to displace anybody. That's the good news. Stuff that you couldn't do before and is there for us to have fun with, even though, of course, there are some things that need to be considered if this stuff was to spread to everyone. You said your audiences liked Spawn and they liked helping to teach Spawn. Do you feel like people are comfortable with having digital musicians alongside human musicians on a stage? I think some of the work that we did with Spawn laid the groundwork for what we're doing with Holly Plus. So we kind of went over some of these issues already and got used to speaking to a wider public about what it means to have a voice model and that it's not a replacement, that it's really just a new way for a human to perform with a machine or through a machine. The work that we've been doing over the last five years has kind of laid the groundwork for Holly Plus and our audience is very used to this concept of performing with uh, machines coming from us. So they're on board. We've always been very aware of stereotypes associated with the field. And so with the last record, when we were touring, we definitely primed a lot of misconceptions that we knew were going to come. For example, it was a record dealing in some ways with machine learning, artificial intelligence. But when people went to the show, there were no robots. There were actually 10 people on stage, which is unusual because prior to that, it was just Holly, Colin and I. We really like stacked it in such a way that it was really clear to such an extent. Actually, one of the greatest compliments we ever got for the show was we played a very large show in New York and the main promoter of the show afterwards came in and was like, what the hell did that have to do with AI? <laughs> <laughs> Which I was like, yes, exactly, exactly. Funnily enough, it actually had more to do with what we understand AI to be than Terminator stories or something like this. Being somewhat in the public eye, we're constantly trying to toy with those expectations a little bit. But fundamentally also, because we actually do care about this, try and make sure that what we put out there is accurate and productive because there's a responsibility there too, I think. The language you used in the first segment was really helpful for me, where you think of it as an instrument, not a consciousness that's producing this music. And it's an instrument that in a way can be crowdsourced, I guess, in a certain sense. I'm curious about the collaborative aspect, because it sounds like far from shutting people out, you're opening the door to a lot more creative collaborations with people all over the world. Does Holly Plus learn from the musicians who work with her, or is she done learning? Well, as Matt mentioned earlier, there will probably be multiple versions of Holly Plus. This version of Holly Plus has already finished learning. So she's not learning from any of the audio that's being uploaded. 
If that were the case, I think we would have to consider how we would be able to give attribution to the people training Holly Plus. That would open up a whole new host of questions for how we create this collective instrument, which I'm interested in. And we could definitely go down that road um, in the future. But currently, she's just trained on my voice and that training has ended. And that's that's as good as she's going to get for now. <laughs> Do you have concrete next models or trainings that you're working on for different instantiations? What is that going to be looking like? Yeah, there's one that we are developing at the moment. It's kind of like a musical text-to-speech. So it will allow for you to type. It also has some understanding of meter and rhythm. So you can kind of type rhythm and have the voice produce something rhythmic in that way. And then there's another one that I can't talk too much about, but that's kind of like the big one. Actually, the musical text-to-speech stuff is stuff that you can kind of do already. There's a service called UberDuck. Uh, there's another one called 13AI. You can go online and also experiment with a very similar system to the one that we're using there. The one that I can't do too much about is actually a bit of a combination of both. It would allow for you to use text, create vocalizations, i.e. like create words, but also produce them in a sung manner that you have a lot of control over. And so that's like the longer term thing that is absolutely coming, but I can't talk too much about it because there's other people involved. So. <laughs> Super secret. <laughs> You mentioned that a lot of what you started with was open source, but you've added your own secret sauce, being able to interpret polyphony and soon down the road, maybe handling language. Will any of that become open source or are you planning on keeping that part of your intellectual property protected? That's a really good question, and it often comes down to our collaborators specifically, what their plans are to commercialize um, certain aspects. And so it's not entirely up to us always. And I think it's also okay to keep some things not open source sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It can get quite tricky because oftentimes the code base is coming from a bunch of different sources. Our principle thus far has been that we're interested in giving people tools to use for free, but that would be in the case of something related to Holly Plus. And if a collaborator we're working with, as Holly said, is planning on using some of their special source in a proprietary thing, we're not going to tell them not to do that. It's quite a tricky, interesting area. I mean, one thing that I think is really cool, though, is that the system that we've come up with through the co-op and through this kind of like certification of official artworks is kind of a virtuous cycle in which we're trying to raise money for the artworks. We're trying to compensate the different artists who used Holly Plus and participate in that process. And then funds from that are going into the development process. And so it's actually been the case so far that with a few projects that we've been doing, we've been funneling profits directly from art sales to fund nascent companies, honestly. We should flesh that out a little bit. Yeah. We're hosting a gallery through Zora where artists can use Holly Plus and create works and sell those works as NFTs. Do, do, do. <laughs> <laughs> For the layperson, that's a non-fungible token. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Just don't read anything about it because it's all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> don't trust your newspaper. <laughs> so these are kind of like officially, you know, accepted by the DAO works into the gallery. And then there's kind of a profit split between the artist who created the work, the DAO itself, and then a, a small portion to myself for being <laughs> the model. So the DAO, the way that it's set up, will be able to ingest these funds and then spend those funds to pay for developer time and server hosting and things like this to be able to further develop tools to make free to the public. I know what an NFT is, and if this is not the best explanation, correct me, but an NFT is a way of selling and tracking and certifying a digital work as being unique and without having multiple copies of it floating around. Because I may not want to pay, let's just say, $100 for a digital artwork if everybody can make a copy of it. Am I sort of understanding that correct? There's a slight change that I would make there because you could theoretically copy it. Like if you bought an NFT of an image, you could copy that image and then you could have that on your computer. But it's really a proof of transfer between the creator of that image and the person who's the patron of that image. So in a way, that image can be widely spread and available to a whole community of people, but it's still paid for by one individual. And that one individual has a certificate that says, hey, I'm the patron for this. So it's a very different understanding of IP Traditionally, in the art market, people might buy a kind of up-and-coming artist's work as an investment, and then they might put that in storage in Switzerland for 20 years and hope that it increases in value, and then nobody gets to see it or enjoy it. This is a very different approach where everybody can enjoy it, but one person is the owner of that work. Exactly. The big bet there is that the more ubiquitous an image is, the more owning the title to that image is valuable. What's funny is there have been many critiques about NFTs saying that they're imposing scarcity, and it, in fact, couldn't be further from the truth. It's the exact opposite. 
NFTs are encouraging ubiquity and trying to figure out a new kind of economic model for how digital artists can make a living while also sharing their work freely and widely with everybody. Because as Holly said, in the traditional art world or the music world, you still have owners, there's scarcity there, but the second that stuff bleeds outside of their control, you get lawsuits or you just get paintings uh, stuck in cold storage, you know, in free ports, which is how the art world works. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of advantages to the system, even though it's a lot to get your head around. There's aspects to it that are counterintuitive, and I think I would concede that, but we are where we are. So I get that you've got this gallery collective where you can derive some funding from, but I'm also genuinely curious, how else do you all actually get paid to do this stuff? I mean, are the gallery sales feeding you? Well, we haven't started doing that yet. I hope they do. We actually launched the um, auction after this conversation, the auction on the gallery site. But traditionally, we have 80 to 90 percent of our income has come from live performances. And so, of course, COVID was a very big barrier for that. So <laughs> we lost a lot of money. <laughs> well, we, we kind of lost everything, yeah. all of our income. So we had to pivot really hard. And so we actually started a podcast, which is patron supported, which is really awesome and has helped us. It's something we wanted to do for a long time, but never really had time because we were touring so much. So actually COVID presented that opportunity. And then we've also been selling our own NFTs separately, not through very recently. Very, yeah, recently, very recently. We're very much live musicians. We're mm -hmm. employed by the live music industry. Let's go. <laughs> so really coming up with the Holly Plus tool is almost kind of a side project or an enhancement to your live performances, I guess. Well, what's strange about us in a weird way, which is maybe idiosyncratic, and it certainly wasn't engineered in this way, but it's just how things transpire, is that generally every album we've done, we've kind of created our own tools to create the record. And so prior to this, we'd done a bunch of other stuff. And the basic thesis there was one, the creation of the tools are kind of art projects in themselves. And then the hope is, is that the record and the performances afterwards are distinct as a result, because there's a kind of harmony between the tools that are being made, the presentation, like every tour, we have a different band configuration. There's a whole other thing going on. And so it all kind of synthesizes together. So I have no doubt that the tools that we're working on right now will end up, in fact, I know for a fact, that they, <laughs> they'll end up on the record upcoming. And it's all part of our wider research practice. Exactly. So it's kind of the way we've hacked it in a way is that we both do have some academic entanglements that don't really pay our bills. And it's like <laughs> the way we've kind of figured out we're the smallest research institution on earth because because we're oftentimes we're funneling money from one source, whether it be live shows or whatever, to be able to fund this thing that then hopefully is interesting enough. At one point, it'll be really, really nice to not have to have three jobs, but that's how it works out. And it's a fulfilling practice. That's just awesome. I guess I just wanted to add in that it's the Interdependence podcast. Mm -hmm. Yes. And where do people go to find that? interdependence.fm or also on Patreon at interdependence. Fantastic. Thank you. I look forward to listening. <laughs> Please do. I'd be curious to hear what you have to think about it. I think it's a pretty good podcast. Honestly, I do. <laughs> you guys are professional performers and vocalizers, so I would, I would hope so. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you all so much for introducing us to this brave new world of machine learning digital musicians. When I was looking at some of the information on your website about how you got to this point with Holly Plus, one of the things that jumped out to me is that you figured out how to make your process more environmentally responsible so that you have a lower environmental impact. 
if you go back a few years, there were definitely a lot of stories talking specifically about the energy consumption of machine learning applications. And then this year, the energy consumption of blockchain applications. We actually had a guest, Dr. Jonathan Kumi, on our podcast to deal with this. He's a scholar, kind of the global expert in technological energy consumption. Specifically <clears throat> when it comes to large-scale networked systems. Exactly. Um, and the same things were said about the original internet. I think he made his name from debunking claims that office internet consumption was going to boil the oceans. Now, of course, when you're talking about Bitcoin energy consumption, Bitcoin does consume a lot of energy. Energy consumption needs to be decoupled from the source of energy, because I don't think energy consumption is necessarily a bad thing. It's about what you burn or what you don't burn, more importantly, to produce that energy. We are working with NFTs, which work on the Ethereum blockchain. But the good news about that, which I like to remind people who often don't know very much about this, is that NFTs actually produce no marginal energy spend in the Ethereum network. The Ethereum network consumes as much energy as it does. The vast bulk of that energy is put to financial applications that have very little to do with the arts. NFTs don't add any extra energy to that. But in terms of this project more generally, we haven't been focusing too much, I think, on the energy consumption of it. But I would also add, I mean, a lot of this has to do with scale. By just focusing on my own voice and the data sets that are pretty small in comparison to a corporate data set that would just be scraping the internet for any kind of voice of a particular category, you know, we're dealing with very small data sets. And so because it's such a smaller scale, it's using so much less electricity. When we're dealing with music too, one other thing that is worth pointing out is our base point at the moment is that people ought to make their living by flying on planes across the earth. And <laughs> and the one thing that everybody's cool with is printing music on literal discs of oil <laughs> that are then shipped across the earth with carbon consuming aeroplanes, you know. And so I think that the conversation when it comes to artists experimenting with digital technology can often be distorted as being somehow more deleterious to the environment than things we already do, which I just don't think it is true. That being said, in terms of dealing with any of these machine learning systems or these kind of blockchain systems, we're all for renewable energy sources. And to be honest, there's kind of a consensus amongst people who take this stuff seriously moving toward that. So I think in a few years time, that conversation will look far more positive. In a technical sense, you are running this project on a server. There's a server somewhere. Just out of curiosity, where is that server located or multiple servers? It is a Google server. <laughs> So you're using commercial cloud services to host this and run your code. And I presume that also lets your collaborative coding group all contribute pushes to the code base. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. And we're also paying for those server costs out of pocket just because we care about this project and want people to be able to use it. Initially, we started out with commercial cloud, one, because it's more cost effective, but number two, because you can never presuppose demand. This project has been out for a couple of weeks and we have a couple of months of continuous music that's been created through it. At one point, there were 18 hits to the server a second. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> that could have gone even crazier. And there's nothing to say that tomorrow a YouTuber doesn't make a video saying, look at this crazy AI thing. And then, you know, so for the time being, we're using Google Cloud infrastructure. Yeah. That's the safe way. <laughs> mm -hmm. If the larger community out there was going to be uploading stuff to have Holly Plus render these tracks, you don't want to have any scaling issues or have the website come crashing down. Exactly. I mean, at a certain point, it would come crashing down, but that <laughs> point's pretty far in the future. And that's the cool thing, too, because obviously the group that we're working with, Never Before Heard Sands, they're doing never before done things, right? <laughs> and so they're actually managing a lot of that cloud interaction. And I think for them, that's also something they're very, very interested in pursuing further because this is a bit of a test case. It's a bit of a stress test of how these things would work in theory going forward. If they can make this run smoothly, that gives the green light to try other things. You have sort of a crew of musicians and coders and technologists that you've been working with for the last five or six years, right? Is there a larger community of people doing these things that you can learn from and collaborate with? 100%. We connect with people via Twitter a lot, you know, also for the visual work that we're doing. We do a lot of GAN created animation work. There are a ton of machine learning creative nerds online that love to share best practices and libraries. And it's actually a really cool community. Often people meet up in discords. We subscribe to a couple discords where we um, share work and just chat general strategy. It's a really cool community. Visual artists and musicians is what you're saying. 
Absolutely. It's still quite nascent, but you know, if you want to get a project done at scale and with a deadline, which we're definitely in the mechanics of that in a way that we weren't a few years ago, it really helps to have close collaborators. But in terms of, you know, everyone from like hard researchers to just hobbyists, there's tens of thousands of people experimenting with similar things right now. And that's why it's so cool that um, some of these universities and corporations have open sourced the code and the white papers and the research so that a wider community of tinkerers mm. can play with it. And what's cool about it too, I mean, we come from a experimental electronic music background and we also had the good fortune of growing up in a time where you had laptops and, you know, you just put Logic on or able or whatever and you tinker a little bit we grew up with the stories of radio hobbyist hackers from like the 1950s or whatever like they were the true inventors not to inflate our own sense of importance but like <laughs> but the, no but there is a similar vibe to this stuff deep diving into these discords you're like wow yeah there's this guy in sweden who has a strange pseudonym who just figured out something insane <laughs> at night there's a genuine kind of like citizen science component to this that i felt like we got robbed of it's the first time i've ever actually had that experience in my adult life and it's very exciting to continue that analogy with like early radio like early recording technologies I archive everything from collaborators, from different people who are online, where I'm like, you know what, that was a breakthrough there. And I think in 30 years time, when this stuff is just integrated and we can all sing as each other and we figured all that stuff out, <laughs> that's going to be valuable. It's an interesting kind of uh, document of a weird time. Being involved in those conversations, thinking about what to do with stuff, like what way to use the stuff would be that would be artistically interesting or technically interesting or whatever it might be, that stuff is thrilling. Sadly, also very niche at this point in time, but that's something to get out of bed for, for sure. But it won't be niche for long. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> you said Holly Plus was sort of done learning, that she knows what she knows, and that's where she's going to stay for a while. But you may create other models. When you're doing machine learning, are there points where you require human intervention to sort of get the model back on the track where you want it? Does it take a human tweaking it, or do you just sort of create a process and then give it a ton of data? So yeah, humans are always in the loop in this process, actually. So the Holly Plus model that we released, I think, was the sixth model mm -hmm. that we ran. And, you know, it's really about tweaking certain weights in how the model responds to certain inputs. So it's all just really sophisticated statistical analysis. And so you can kind of weight those statistics in different ways and tweak your outcome. But that's kind of the strange misnomer of working with machine learning is people are saying, oh, it'll replace humans and all these kind of things. It's actually such a huge human intensive process. You know, you have to make the data set, you have to edit and craft that data set, and then you have to train the model, and then you have to push the model into different directions, and then you edit the outcome. So it's a very human interactive experience the entire time. We're joking, it's the least automated thing we've ever done. Um, just, <laughs> yeah, coming from like Photoshop or something like that, where you're like, yeah, just crop it. The automation thing is kind of a fallacy. But I think there's also legitimacy to the concern in the sense that while we definitely enjoy the custom side of things and get a thrill from customizing things to produce maybe an idiosyncratic piece of artwork or whatever it might be, and that's what we care about, there are real concerns where it will be possible to automate a fairly good enough piece of X music, right? So when you have people who, for example, earn their living from producing music that they don't believe to be the pinnacle of artistic expression, but it makes them a living, there is cause for concern because that stuff can be automated now. While on the one hand, we're coming at this from a, yeah, you can make your own model and then weight it in this particular way to emphasize these things. That's all really cool as a creative act. But I do think that there's legitimacy to some of the displacement fears when it might just be good enough for one person at a company somewhere to say, okay, well, here's the Hans Zimmer model. I weighted it to just kind of sound like Hans Zimmer. So now anytime you need a cheap score for your movie, this will cost you 20 bucks. It's already kind of happening. And again, I feel like it's inevitable, but I feel like history is on our side and like human interest and curiosity is on our side because fundamentally the dystopian scenario where there's no room for human expression anymore and everyone just listens to crap pushed out by an algorithm somewhere. I just don't buy it. The easier it becomes to make something, the harder it becomes to distinguish yourself and people want to distinguish themselves. But fundamentally, I think the cream always rises. And no doubt in 20 years time, there'll be something else where people are like, this is going to ruin all music and humans are irrelevant. And it's like, okay, no, this is an old conversation, guys. When we first started talking, you said you could take our recording from this session and by the end of the day, have a singer in Craig's voice, right? You wouldn't want a singer in my voice. But, um, <laughs> 
if anybody can take these audio processing tools or image processing tools and slap something together and then say, well, there you go, that's the same thing. But it sounds like you've really put a lot of thought and energy and personal investment into getting Holly Plus to be an instrument that you find appealing and aesthetic and nice to work with, that all that human investment, human interaction has made it more than something that you chop up and edit and say, okay, now we can deep fake Craig. I want a shallow fake. <laughs> <laughs> deep real. The one thing I'll say on that is that model training information does matter. While anyone will be able to bootleg something, it's very different for me to take Craig's voice from this call or to sit with Craig in the studio for hours and hours and hours and get him to make the most comprehensive model possible. And so that's one of the bets we're making with this project is that, yeah, anyone will be able to do it. But ultimately, what we imagine will happen is that you're going to have official models that are really, really high fidelity. They're really complex. And those will be preferable that you'd rather, in a way, maybe spend the 50 bucks or whatever to use that. And then an analogy there would be like sample packs. Like in music, there is a world where you can sample anything. If you have a sampler, it's really easy. But people buy a lot of sample packs because they want the kick drum perfectly isolated. They want it in the highest fidelity or they like that it comes from the source. And also just because you have the Craig model doesn't mean you will come up with the same brilliant expressions that Craig might come up with. So that's kind of the really fun thing is that (laughs) you can perform through someone else's identity. We've already seen a kind of wide range of people using the Holly Plus model and they're so different. The things that people are coming up with, you can immediately make a judgment of which ones you prefer and the kind of the aesthetic qualities. So that's what's so exciting about it is it really is a kind of instrument that people are using in a creative way. On the podcast this week, we had a group on called Aletheia AI who were trying to use these kind of language models to help model characters. And so they're writing scripts and have come up with their own special source for coming up with characters that have these very rich dimensions to them. And that stuff's going to also be kind of crazy because there you can imagine the bootleg will be someone who, sorry that Craig, you're being volunteered (laughs) as the guinea pig here, but the bootleg will be someone who listened for 10 minutes and then comes up with a stereotypical impression of what Craig's personality might be. But the high fidelity model will be most likely writers Mm -hmm. and people who know somebody fleshing out this personality so that when you're talking to them through a game or something like that, what comes back is believable. I'm reflecting about all the artists who are going to be coming after you and what a blessing it is to have you all who have technical skills, academic skills, artistic skills, and legal skills (laughs) (laughs) to figure this all out. Those are not intersecting domains. Yeah, I mean, not to be hyperbolic, but I feel like it is truly experimental in every facet. That is both exhausting and really exciting. But I feel like that's kind of our role. My joke is our role in the ecosystem is to do things that way bigger people can't do for cheap. We end up taking all the risk. We're like spending money and like Holly's putting her personality out there and who knows. And I have noticed we've had quite a few followers from major labels um, in the past little while. It's like, okay, let's see how they do. We're the the free R&D wing for the wider industry. But at the same time, it's cool because it's the work and it's kind of what we do and it's engaging. I have no doubt there'll be different tweaks. We'll see how the auction stuff goes. We'll see how the approval stuff goes. I have no doubt in the next few years, we'll start to see bigger names who, to be honest, have a lot to gain and to lose from not addressing this issue, adopting most likely very similar logics to us should this work out and we not end up in (laughs) some crazy hot water we didn't realize that we were getting ourselves into. Holly, Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today about your various projects. We really appreciate your time and enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank this you. Been yeah, this really is... fun. <laughs> <laughs> and if you would like more information about Holly Herndon and these various projects, you can visit hollyherndon.com. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council, produced in partnership with KUNM FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum.